Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox again. I'm in the third lesson of the course introduction. That's called um, the course part one. It consists, I divided the detailed discussion of the course into three parts. This is the first of those three parts. Lesson three, lessons four and five are the second two of those three parts. And then that's the end of this whole uh, video. And we are just giving some, uh, not great deal of details, but just some brief discussion of the different units in this course. All right, so <clears throat> the following unit the following unit to this is still part of the uh, introduction uh, introduction section, section one, and that's the so-called motivation. And it's a variant of the introduction to the course, uh, just uh, expanding on uh, big data and its current status. Um, with um, overall introductions to what is big data, then just a discussion of why, where data is, for the so-called data deluge, uh, which includes the uh, 16 zettabytes we're going to get by 2016, the 1.8 billion photos uploaded to the internet every day, uh, the 15 petabytes uh, analyzed by the Large Hadron Collider every year, and so on. Then we discuss why you're taking this class. There are lots of jobs in data science. Then we go to trends, which are vary from Moore's law to other trends of the internet, and why they're driving what we're seeing. <clears throat> well, actually, part some of these trends are being driven by the internet. So, like e-commerce, which is taking over from shopping shopping malls, is being driven by this. Uh, is both Driven by this technology and driving the technology, that's wrapped in hand in hand, marching forward. In the next section, next uh, part of this uh, um, <coughs> uh, motivation, which is a separate lesson, we discuss the past, namely what has happened to the mouse and what will happen to the mouse. There is a discussion uh, section on the um, community group called No More Mouse. Query mark where we discuss the implications of, of the internet and e-commerce and big data on mouths. Then we look at the whole computing model and where we know the key point is that industry and as we, as is such a dominant force, uh, we will use clouds to um, do a data analytics and we will point out why it's attractive to data analytics. <coughs> Then we discuss a sort of the research side of, um, of big data, which is the so-called fourth paradigm, data-driven science, and how theory, we're not moving from theory to data-driven science, we're spanning theory to data-driven science, so that uh, everything fits together to make progress. Then we have a look at this whole field we're working on, data science and the process used to analyze data, that's the data information knowledge wisdom pipeline, which DIKW, which underlies all of this. And of course, that's followed by decisions and uh, general community consensuses and so on, things like that. Uh, then we actually go through some of the topics discussed in more detail in this class. We have a few slides on uh, the physics informatics of looking for the Higgs boson with the Large Hadron Collider in CERN Geneva. Then we have a little look at recommender systems and uh, their implications for algorithms. Then we look at web search and information retrieval, another major application discussed in this class. We look at uh, how research uses clouds, actually doesn't use clouds very often. Then we do parallel computing and uh, map produce and how they're matched together nicely. And then we have some comments on sort of the more, on, not, not the topic of the course, but the methodology of this course, namely data science education and its opportunities at universities. And then we have conclusions. Thank you. So that's, this motivation is one unit and lots of lessons. Because what is the longest unit? All right, here we have uh, three units, which is the introduction to, the, to this class. And uh, those units cover the following things. What is X-informatics? And of course, the rallying cry 
the jobs again, data deluge again, the process of data science, various aspects of the data deluge, the internet, lots of business applications, the data deluge for science and research. Always when I say science, you nearly always should say science and engineering. Um, then we have the implications of the data deluge for the scientific method. That's what was called the fourth paradigm on the previous slide. Then we have an important comment, which is not just true for science, is the so-called long tail. Disks are so big, they can store information about a lot of things. Whereas, for instance, physical shops can't keep everything. So this is a well-known uh, feature of the internet uh, shopping revolution that uh, it sells more rare things than the real stores do. Because uh, if you want to do buy a real thing, a uh, rare thing from a store, you have to order it specially. Whereas uh, on the internet, well, it's um, maybe slightly harder to get, but not a lot. And there's a this is the sort of concept of the long tail supported by the internet. And the long tail of science is there's so-called big science, like the several thousand people on the Large Hadron Collider experiment. And there's little science, in science done by individuals, where there are so many individuals that together they add up to make major progress. And then we have the very important area of the Internet of Things. Uh, that's discussed in sensors in this, in this course. Then we look at clouds. Then we look at aspects and features of the data deluge and the uh, data science process and data analytics. That is just giving a little more detail than what we had up here. So after that the technology discussion, we come back to use cases. With the first uh, use case we come to now is for many people, the most interesting, certainly for Indiana University undergraduates, the most interesting is sports informatics. In fact, you can take this particular unit earlier. This now doesn't have to be taken at this time in the in the sequence. So this has actually this section on sports informatics has three units. Uh, the first two units are on um, baseball and. Also, some introductory material to the general field of sports informatics. But baseball, as far as I can see, based on what's on the web at least, is far more advanced in, uh, in the use of analytics and, and informatics than other fields. And it's, of course, well known to people through the movie Moneyball, which uh, is sort of basic baseball informatics or baseball analytics. And this whole area is called sabermetrics. Coming from the uh, SABR uh, uh, work on uh, research in uh, baseball uh, analytics. And sabermet we go through various sabermetric measures, both simple ones like uh, slugging and on base percentage and stuff like that, um, ERA for pitchers, but then we do a more advanced ones, and including the so called uh, War wins above replacement. We look at the the relationship between performance and dollars, and then we also go through with the really quite important uh, quantitative use of video in these uh, systems: pitch FX, field FX, hit FX, and command FX, coming from this innovative company, Sport Vision. And how you can analyze the video to extract the ball position, extract the hit of the picture, extract the motion of the field, or extract the motion of the of the catch. That's what Command FX does. It hit FX obviously does the batter. And field FX the um, fielder. And so you see baseball is advanced actually in two types of areas. It actually uses the video to do quantitative predictions, whereas in the other sports, as we'll see in the third unit, the video still exists, but it's only used for what I call spatial visualization, making pictures of where people do what on the field. Uh, so, uh, whereas on, in baseball, that video is translated into, into measures like uh, speed of the fastball and whether, or whether the particular pitch was uh, a particular type of pitch. 
a slider or a fastball, for example. That was all done from the video analysis, and that is fed into sabermetrics measures as, uh, and then used to derive these predictions as to the value of players, the doing a detailed analysis of which player to play when, and of course, for the player. How much is how much you can afford to pay it, which requires this pretty interesting discussion of the relationship between dollars and performance, which is non-trivial. Uh, different teams have different relationships. It depends very much on how much money you get if you do well, compared to how much money you get if you do badly. New York Yankees, that's a big factor there. For other smaller teams, it's not such a big factor. So in this third unit, we do other sports, and these are listed here, soccer, Olympics, NFL, American football, basketball, tennis, and horse racing. We look at wearables uh, and their application, we like for sports, uh, consumer sports. We do spatial visualization in general. And these sports are still pretty interesting application of analytics, but they have not reached the maturity of baseball. And the reason why baseball is actually Ahead is partly just innovative people in the field, and also just because there is slightly easier to analyze in, in a precise fashion, because every action in baseball often only involves one person and the ball. The pitcher throws the ball, that's just the pitcher. The batter hits the ball, the fielder runs to the ball, and the catcher catches the ball. Each of those actions can be analyzed independently and produce measures describing them, and that is. Um, Gives you baseball informatics, where if you play soccer, many players are milling around trying to hit the ball, and so is same is true in basketball. These multiplayer sports are much harder to analyze, and there, the current analytics is just somewhat more qualitative. And now we come on to health informatics, which has advanced a lot over the last uh, couple of years since I first did these lectures. I've, I've uh, there's been a lot of material, and I've Extended the, this section accordingly. Um, we have um, a dis general discussion, including the current state of healthcare in the U.S. The you know the how much the dreadful 17% of the GDP that it takes, and uh, other important issues like people living longer, or somewhat more positively, an increasing use of telemedicine or virtual interactions. That's again directly informatics. You have sensors and people at one end of our link, doctors and analysis systems at the other end. We have a discussion from a Accenture survey of data analytics in, in the healthcare industry. We go to an example, a big cloud-based big data medical platform. This has only recently been described. And it's um, an example of the fact that, uh, that only recently have some of the things that people predicted to happen started to happen. People knew you could do cloud-based big data medicine, but only recently has that been realized and described. We discuss some different aspects of uh, big data in, uh, in medicine, focusing on images, because those images are a critical characteristic of, um, of medical data, and actually the largest source of data at the moment, because genes are not yet, or gene sequencing is not a big effect at the moment. We look at general issues of clouds, focusing on Security for the which is critical for the health application. We go to three reports: McKinsey, Microsoft, and the European Union, which all focus on different aspects of the of healthcare. We look at a little short module on Internet of Things and healthcare. Then we have an amusing um, section from the Robert uh, Woods. Uh, Johnson Foundation, which is looking at four scenarios for healthcare in 2032. Two are positive, one is depressing, and one is middle of the road. And they sort of go through what's going on. And so actually, it's pretty interesting because a lot of what's going on implies that um, what they predict to happen implies changes in society due to the digital revolution. The final section looks at the promise of genomics and proteomics and information visualization in this field. We have our so-called side MOOC on Python for big data. Uh, there are endless discussions of um, Python online, which are really excellent. It's not possible for 
uh, or necessary, in fact, for us to compete with it. So we just have a very brief overview. We there are many ways of um, in using Python. We use the system called Canopy, available from NThought uh, online. And then we discuss uh, with uh, NumPy in three lessons. That's the numerical version of, of, of Python. Then we look at Matplotlib, which is what we use for doing our plots in this course. It's a pretty nifty plotting package. And then we have a couple of uh, lessons on SciPy, which is where you'll find the scientific libraries, which are quite well supported in Python. Python does everything except parallelism well. It's very nice, interactive, intuitive. It just runs like a dog because it's not running in parallel. Then we have another so called side MOOC. Remember that um, I told you that the side MOOCs tended to be off the mainstream of the logical structure. They are defined as units and uh, lessons and things. And we, this is a side MOOC on the back end cloud, which is not necessary for you to use. You can do your work on your own computer, whether it be Python or Java. So we describe what the future systems is. We show you how to create an account on it, which is done through the portal. How you upload uh, your open ID, you upload an SHH key to give you security. Uh, the class will have a project associated with it. You join that project, and I will then give you uh, rights to run on future systems. And then I will discuss how the Python use of Python in that environment and the use of Java in that environment. So that's this is an optional side move because you can do everything on your laptop or your favorite computer, in fact. Say so you can use Amazon, Azure, Google Compute, Compute Engine, etc.